Hey everybody, Dr. Deuce here. A little late. It's uh, problems on my end, technologically insufficient. But here we are with our uh, MTFU Longevity live stream with my guest today, my good friend Gordon Falsetti. Uh, I'm going to do my little uh, one or two minute diatribe here first. The eternal conundrum that we. How's it going, guys? We, hey, hey Gord, uh, the eternal conundrum that we see with many of the people who are trying to make a change in their life, not just bodybuilders and athletes, but regular people too, mostly across the landscape of the entire society, millions and millions of people, most people will either attain their goal and go back to where they were and get even worse. And most people just don't really actualize what they have in their head as their ideal body type and their life and, and the way they should look and feel and what they think they deserve. And there's reasons for that that I've noticed, and more so my friend Gordon, because Gordon's one of the top trainers in the industry. Um, he's trained national champions. Uh, his his ex-wife, uh, with whom he's still good friends, Jamie Pinder, fifth place Miss Olympia. She's one of the best in the world, and we'll talk about the Miss Olympia because we're bringing that back, which is a good thing, I think. Uh, but Gordon is a no-nonsense, straight-shooter, forward-thinking type of guy. He only attracts people who buy into the idea that it, there's certain things that have to be done and there's no negotiating to make a change in your body because one of the hardest things for anybody to do is to make a change. Uh, people um, uh, are repelled by change. They don't like change. They thrive in the sameness of the mediocrity that they live in or worse uh, because it's easy and it gives you excuses. But we don't accept excuses here. We want people. If we give them our time, they want we want them to buy and do what we're giving them because then there's success all the way along. And Gordon is not only a, a really good bodybuilder, he started body, he started competing way back in 1999. And happy birthday, Gordon. He just turned 40, uh, which beats the alternative of not turning 40. And he still looks much younger than his stated age, which is another good thing. Um, but he competed all the way through and came out to fourth place in a national competition. So He's got that pedigree all taken care of. We've got a little bit of a connection problem here today, folks, but that won't be a problem. He's Gordon's uh, going to be you. talking, so we won't have that lapse between him and I, unless I have to intervene, as I do occasionally. Uh, but, you know, he's been around a long time. He's seen all the best. He's seen many different types of genetic phenotypes and people and physiologies and responses, and he understands that there's no good cookie-cutter approach. And I did invite some of you, some of our members who have made tremendous changes in their bodies to come here today and, and maybe put some thoughts down or suggestions or ideas or questions uh, uh, as far as what has challenged you or bugged you or even things that we could pick up on. Because remember, all the people, the vast span of people I've talked to over the years, I never subscribe to 100% of what they say uh, because everybody's different. Uh, so I like to cherry pick. I talk to a bunch of different people and then I use all the different things that I pick up and I try to figure out what's going to work for me. And that's all that really matters. What is good for you, not what the next guy is doing. And that's why we also don't like comparison very much, which is kind of a, a, a difficult to use that word again, conundrum in this industry, because in bodybuilding, you're comparing yourself to other people, weightlifting, you're comparing strength. Uh, and when you do those things, uh, you know, you sometimes let down because you can't meet up to those expectations. So if you stay within yourself and just work within yourself, there's only you, and you can only be as good as you can be. And I'm rambling, so I'm going to turn it over to Gordon. Gordon, tell us how you started out in all this. You know, you you started long enough ago where where it wasn't so popular back in the '90s, like it is now. Yeah, yeah, man. I got started a long time ago. So I originally started lifting weights at like 12 years old in my best friend's basement. Now, back then was a time when there was no internet or anything like that. That was like 1991, 1992. So, you know, we learned by buying books and buying magazines. And my friend and I just spent hours in his basement teaching each other form that we learned and just trying everything under the sun that we could ever figure out. And over time, you know, we got gym memberships and that sort of thing. And, and things kind of evolved a little bit. Um, but my first actual competition experience was 1999. Um, that was the ANBC Natural Connecticut Bodybuilding Championships. And after that competition, I had no idea what I was doing or anything like that. I spoke to people, but I didn't really know anyone that competed. There was no such thing as the internet, really. Or it was just 
getting started. There wasn't much information on it. Um, you know, so I bought a couple, couple of books and, and I fi- kind of figured out what I did um, and ended up winning that surprisingly, wow. um, which was huge for me. That was kind of the first thing I had place, first placed in. So that was a pretty awesome experience. Um, and then from there, things actually kind of slowed down for me a little bit. Um, I took a little bit of a downtime through my early 20s. I was partying in college and stuff like that. Um, but I kind of got back to this. Um, around 2007, I got back in the gym really, really seriously. Uh, and at that point, I started making connections with a lot of people that competed and, and that kind of stuff. Um, doing what I was doing for a couple of years. I built my baby back. Um, I started a really nice physique and I thought, you know, I should think about competing again. Um, and then I went back into the 2010 NPC Connecticut championships down in New Haven. Um, and that was a much bigger level competition than the first one I had done. Uh, but again, I won. I was a middleweight in that show. Um, won that one. And it just kind of so, went from there, you know, so and I made my way minute, up toward the national over the next few years. Let me get this straight. So your first two shows, you won. And then there's a guy like me uh, who took 16 years to win the Mr. Connecticut on a very off year, <laughs> I'll admit. Uh, but so, so let me ask you, you see, I was driven because I, I you know, I, I, I wasn't winning. But what made you go on? Because usually people who have a lot of, a lot of success right away, they kind of say, OK, that's enough. You know, it was that it was so fun for me, Mike. I just enjoyed it so much, enjoyed the training so much, and just everything about what I was doing made me so happy. There was no reason for me to stop. Right. Um, You know, that was around the same time where I met my ex-wife, Jamie, also, who you said she was a, you know, became a high level competitor at the time though, when we met, she was kind of just getting started. Um, and she's kind of the reason I kept going past there too, because we were kind of in it together. So to speak, and we kind of fed off each other and we pushed each other really hard. Um, and it was actually our relationship kind of was a, was a big, point in in both of us getting to the point that we did in 2014 or something like that um you know so i think she was probably one of the main driving forces the reason i kept going you know even once i was already winning um but the other thing was i mean you always have in the back of your head you know pro card i kind of knew that you know genetically in terms of my structure i'm not really built like a top pro, but that's kind of always in the back of your head. So I wanted to see how far I could go. Um, but that's what took me to the national level, at least, you know, and then from there, I realized my limitations a little bit more. When I finally got to the national level stuff is when I realized that there are guys that have so much genetic potential in terms of their structure, in terms of their muscle bellies and their fullness, that no matter what kind of kid or anything like that that I and I was never going to compete with that beautiful structure and that's bodybuilding you know no. and uh, posted, and that's the lesson I learned there I posted a picture of you um you know when you first competed and then at your zenith and it's a big difference like a 60 pound difference so what told you just in irrespective of what you were just saying about seeing these other guys you know, you looked good when you were, you know, younger, but what told you that you can go, you know, gain another 60 pounds? Because that's, you know, I, I don't know if I would have foreseen that happening, you know? Like you talk to Evan, Evan says, you know, the size he is now, he was that size when he was 20, and then it was refinement. So usually when you're a genetic freak, you know early on, right? Nothing more. I think we're losing audio here. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Okay. Now, and that's the thing about me is I'm not a genetic freak by any means. I don't build muscle really fast. Um, I get in shape fairly easily, but I don't build muscle really fast. And so in order for me to get to the point that I was at, I had to work my ass off. Yeah. It's going so long. Oh. Can you hear cutting me? out a loop. No, no. Well, cutting out in and out. Would you say that people mentioning working hard, would you say people across the board work hard enough in general? Yeah, you're cutting out too. Oh boy. Hey, can people hear us? Uh, I've got a lot of people on here now. Can some of you tell us whether you can hear us or not? Just chime in. Got a uh, Lisa Carpenter, John Defendis's girlfriend, Frank Berry. Uh, he knows he knows Gordon, and he says Gordon has always looked great. Zin Zhu, how are you, Zin? Hope everything's going okay. Let us know if you can hear us. Uh, some that's say, a that's a really big question. I think the. Frank says he hears me, but not not you, Gordon. If you can hear that. Hey, Frank. How are you, Frank? You're looking good, man. You got a contest coming? Yeah, it's sticking. Well, we'll, we'll try to eradicate it, people. Uh, he keeps going away. We'll, we'll figure it out. That Zuckerberg's probably messing with us somehow. <laughs> Uh, his part is frozen. Yeah, I know, Zin. Hey, Zin, where are you yeah, calling? Yeah, there's something going on with my connection, I think. All right. What do you think? You think we should continue or try again next time or something? Oops. Well, I lost Gordon. He's going to try to fix it on his end. Hey, listen, anybody out there, uh, like Frank, you made a tremendous uh, change in your body. Uh, what was the one thing that you did that made you convert? Because that's really what we're trying to uh, discover here today. The people who, you know, most people don't do what you did, Frank. They're not successful. Uh, you're going you're, you're gonna to train next year. Oh, yeah, so it's very hard to train with all this stuff going on. Uh, hey, Steve, how are you? Steve Onberger. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we got a lot of good people coming on in the coming weeks. I got a long line of people already scheduled. You know, very famous, very successful, you know, some not so known, but everybody in their own right uh, has a lot of value to offer, which I like to disseminate. And then we can cherry pick and find what works for us as individuals best. Hey, Joe Natarelli. Thanks, man. Uh, I'm always encouraging Zin. Yes, I don't want anybody jumping off buildings. <laughs> Zin Zhu. Hey, Zin Zhu, where are you calling me from? Are you in China or where are you from? Uh, I'd like to know that. And Lisa Carpenter, I'm going to be using your services for reasons that you could observe right now. <laughs> a little bit of technological improficiency. Uh, Gordon's coming back right now. So let's see what we got. Let's Hi, Gordon. This... How are we doing? Oh, that looks a lot better. Uh, that looks a lot better. I think I did it. it. looks clearer. I think we're there. All right. That's a beautiful All right, Hey, that's good. You found, the, you found the sweet spot in your household. You no, probably had to get my cell phone. Oh, 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 okay. Well, you probably had to kick a couple of cats out of it. You know, I, one of the reasons I like, I like Gordon also is because he helps cats and he has cats in his house and they're like his children. And, you know, we try to help everything. You know, I publish a book, all the money. There's not a lot of money in publishing, by the way, but it goes to help the struggling animals. So in that sense, Gordon helps not only humans, but cats too. But let's let's go back to where we were, where we were talking about. I mentioned something. Would you say that people, whatever their goal might be, whoever falls under your umbrella, do they train hard enough? It, here's the thing. The people that train hard enough are the people that want it bad enough. That's the big question, is how bad do the people want the results, okay? Right. Because here's the thing. There's a lot of people that say that they want to look a certain way or they say that they want to feel a certain way but when it really comes down to it and you have to put the work in and you have to put the time in, there's an awful lot of people that don't get there be either because they don't work hard or because they're not patient enough. Now, the people that truly decide that they want to make this change, they're going to work hard 
and they're going to be patient enough. So it all comes down in the end to, do you really want it? Or are you telling your friends that you want it and just complaining? You know, and, and I guess that's the big question for a lot of people. You and I have observed this in the gym because I see you down there a lot. We always have our, our, our lovely uh, uh, chats. Um, and I mentioned this and we might upset a couple of men, but I think you'd agree. It seems that your female clients train harder than the men. Yes. In general, women tend to <laughs> weight train harder than men do. And I don't know why that is exactly. Uh, but yeah, as a rule of thumb, I find that my female clients tend to work harder than the men do in the weight room. I noticed that. They have a higher pain tolerance. Um, they can just work harder and longer. Yeah, it's, it's a wild thing. The pain tolerance in the literature, it's stated that that's because of, you know, their are my phone around. I'm trying to get no, it. You're good. No, this is, this is, this is fine. You're keeping me, you're keeping me on my, on, on it, on, on, on point. Uh, but no, uh, the, the, the female birthing system, you know, they, they've got a uterus and all that, and they've got, uh, mediators that, uh, temper pain because of childbirthing. And that might tie into the, you know, the, the actual, um, pain tolerance in the gym. I notice anyhow. And they seem more serious. They seem more bent on doing things correctly, not cheating, right? The numbers don't mean as much as far as how much. Is that true? Yeah, I'll say this. So most of my female clients, especially the competition clients, they have perfect form all the time. If I teach them a particular form to a movement, it's still going to look like that the next time I see them do it, even if it's months later. Really? I can't always really say that with a lot of the guys. What, and, happens, what happens with the guys? Guys' form tends to go to crap when they want to lift, when they want their weights to increase faster than they're physically capable of increasing them. So, you know, everyone gets to the point where at first everything's great. You know, they're Gordon, like Gordon, I'm sorry. This, these are the only times I interrupt. We've got Kenny Wallach here. Great seeing you both. Hey, Kenny. Uh, you Frank Ferry, who is the guy down in Florida, trains with Mick Souza, who's a top-level guy from back in the day. He likens you to him, which is a big compliment. But Frank's done really, really well. And a couple of other people here saying hi, Joe Natarelli, Steve Umberger. They all seem to know you. You, you are preeminent in your countenance, uh, Gordon. Uh, so that's good. That's good. We won't have anybody here that wants to break you in two today. So we have that meter measuring likability factor. So people like you. But any, well, how about people who come and you give them a, a nutrition program and then they come back and they want to negotiate as far as what has to be done? What do you, how do you handle that? Uh, I mean, you know, it depends on the type of negotiation. Now, if it's because there are particular foods people don't like or something like that, that's fine. I can work with those type of issues. But when people come to me and they say, um, like, for instance, I'll, I have a, a certain way that I set up meals around people's training, around their weight training. And, you know, sometimes I'll have people say to me after they get their program, well, I prefer to do it this way. Can I do it my way? And I say, well, if your way is working, then why are we having this talk right now? You know, and, <laughs> yeah, right. and so that's the thing. There can't really be a lot of discussion about that kind of stuff if you want to do things correctly. You know, for the most part, each fitness coach has a particular way that he does things. And he's going to work off of a sort of different methodology, but it's going to be fairly specific to each coach. So, you know, in, in finding a coach that works for you, it's important to find one that is going to do things in a way that you feel good about. Um, and that's, you know, why it's good that there's so many options out there, I suppose. Um, as, far as, as, far, as far as options, why you're one of my go-to guys when people need a, a trainer and a coach um, is you also manage people who have clinical issues, uh, you know, diabetes gluten enteropathies, celiac sprue disorder, whatever it might be. So you're not some guy who just got, I'm not meaning to disparage anyone, but there are a lot of people who deserve to be disparaged, okay? And you're not one of those guys who, you know, got got your certificates from a, a one-hour, two-hour internet course. It's born from many years of experience, education, trial and error, and obviously doing no harm. So you could take those people. So obviously not everyone gets the same thing, right? Right, right. I mean, going back to what you just said, you know, a great deal of my clients are just general health people and general fitness people. And a lot of them come to me very overweight on all kinds of medications and scripts from their doctor. So for instance, I had a guy a few years back that came to me. He was on like two different blood pressure medications, something for cholesterol, 
He was borderline diabetic. He wasn't on insulin yet, but they were considering metformin. Right. And, and so, you know, within six months of working with me, and keep in mind, I had him eating saturated fat every day. He was eating whole eggs every day, red meat every day. His doctor had him off of his cholesterol meds, off of his blood pressure meds, you wow. know, in six months ago. And even his doctor wanted to talk to me because he didn't really understand how that works. And, um, you know, that kind of stuff is really eye opening to me, actually. Um, two, two, because... two, 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 I'm sorry. Important. Oh, no. because I'll, I'll forget things. Two questions. Uh, are people always forthcoming with you? And sub uh, subset to this question. Can you tell when they're not? And do you ever have loggerheads or clashes with their professionals who are managing them, such as their doctors? Like, what the hell are you doing to my guy? You know what I'm saying? These are these are dicey. Because I, I'm always on here. I do a lot of business on here now. And I've got to be very careful because a person will tell me things and their interpretation of what's going on with their body is not correct. So I, unless I can do a physical examination, it's very dangerous for me to give advice. As, are those prevalent issues with what you do? So when I work with a client, I ask for a large amount of communication with them. And when people send me updates to their plans, I require a lot of information. And sometimes it's even paragraphs they have to write for me. And if they don't give me that information, that's kind of a red flag to me. And I start digging a little bit more because you're right. What we do when we're working with people's bodies, we have to be really careful and we need a lot of information. If something or a particular body system isn't working properly and I don't know about it, you know, it may negatively affect fat loss or muscle gain or something like that. But beyond that, it may become a health issue. So, you know, it's important that there's a, a real high level of communication between a coach and a client. You know, I tell I tell people, you know, never be afraid that you're giving me too much information. I want too much information. And would you would you that? consider would you consider what you do? Because I don't like to just call you a trainer uh, or anybody who's worth their salt. You know, you're you're like a, a, a health strategist. I, that's what I call myself. Because you don't want to pigeonhole yourself. Uh, would you consider this health care, what you procure for people? Or should it be considered that? <laughs> I've never called it that, but I suppose you could kind of consider it a form of health care. You know, I, I mean, I have a large amount of people that, you know, come to me for general health stuff. Like I said, even beyond what their doctor does for them, because a lot of time a doctor doesn't always understand the intricacies of nutrition, you know, fixing issues and blood work through food and stuff like that. Um, Gordon, so Gordon, one second. You don't you don't just train athletes and bodybuilders. You have regular people, correct? And number one, and number two, I, I don't attack anyone, but everybody has value. But your average allopath, medical doctor, versus I'm a chiropractor. Uh, some people ask me, they'll see my credit card, it says Dr. Deuce. Oh, what kind of doctor are you? I, I simply tell them the kind that helps people. Because the other bullshit, oh, why aren't you an orthopedic surgeon? Look, that's not relevant. Um, and now and your average allopath in medical school gets this much nutrition, not even that much anatomy, believe it or not. You're a nutritionist in an anatomist times infinity compared to your average allopath. And you're so you understand that, correct? Yes. Yes. You know that. I run into that stuff all the time. You know, I work with like you said, I work with a really wide range of clients. So, you know, I have people from high school kids all the way up to people in their 70s and 80s doing general health stuff. And then all the athletes and stuff in between. Um, so I have a lot of issues like that where where I run in. I see people with all kinds of health issues all across the board. And it's interesting to see how different doctors handle that stuff. Because you're right. From what I've been hearing from a lot of my friends that are doctors, they get like a couple weeks of nutrition information in med school. And, you know, that's pretty sad when you think about, you know, how important nutrition is to every single system in our body. It's what controls everything that happens in our entire body. So, you know, the fact that they don't teach that in medical school is a crazy thing to me. It should be the basis of the entire medical system, as far as I'm concerned. Basis. You know, uh, I had John Romano on here the other day. He was saying, you know, never mind anabolic steroids. He said the most potent drug is or should be food. Yep. Uh, number one. Uh, number two, for you, Here's a challenging question, maybe not so challenging for you, but maybe would you how would you compare, you know, when you take the government's idea of ideal body weight 
how would you compare being uh, over that by 30 pounds, 30 pounds lean mass, 30 pounds obesity, and is there a difference? I mean, I don't know where those recommended weights really come from. I don't think they make a lot of sense necessarily. Probably, probably a bunch of fat guys. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm certainly not a big advocate of the body mass index or anything like that. Um, I mean, I think extra weight on the body is extra weight on the body, you know, is one way of looking at it. Um, you know, so for instance, if we have a guy that's 300 pounds and, you know, 200 pounds of lean mass and the rest is body fat, yeah, it's going to be a big strain on his heart and stuff like that. But the same thing is going to apply if a guy's 300 pounds of pure muscle, okay? Because now it's, it's weighing his body down, but it also requires more blood flow, more nutrients and that kind of stuff. So it's just different ways to look at it. I don't know that anybody is particularly healthy being, you know, 50 pounds overweight. I think that being closer to your ideal weight and nice and lean is probably, probably a better place to be. For instance, me personally, right now I'm about 180 pounds. I'm under 10% body fat and I feel super, super healthy. Now, there was a time in my life where I was 230 pounds at like 5% body fat. I looked awesome, but I didn't feel nearly as healthy as I do now. Is that when you got to your zenith in competing? I mean, you were, you were really big. Yeah, yeah you, were I, one of the big, you were one of the big guys. Yeah, I was one of the bigger guys around the gym for sure. Um, but what people don't realize is a lot of times those really big guys, their blood pressure's up and it's hard to breathe when they walk a long way and stuff like that so you know it's about I, I i think it's about finding the balance is the important thing for most people if you're not competing it doesn't make sense to go for crazy crazy muscle mass yeah. you know it, it, it makes sense to go for you know a higher degree and enough that makes you happy but to go to extremes i think is a bad idea you know i'm going to mention this now because i know he's a good friend of yours and i met him he's a very nice guy and he's one of the leaders in the industry and i've seen some Dip shit. You know, I cut down on my swearing because we're growing on YouTube and there's these new indices. If you swear a lot, they'll, they'll take, you know, that specter of Zuckerberg. If you're doing anything, you're out. Uh, but, you, you know, you look at John Meadows and somebody started mentioning drugs, drugs, drugs. I'm like, number one, that's kind of irresponsible because it's not clinically relevant necessarily. There's no proof in the literature. I can go on and on. You can have these things without. But he is a big guy at the age of 48, 49. And I can tell, I'll say this, not directly related to him, but it made me think of this. You don't see too many 80 year olds who weigh 300. Nope. And, and to be honest with you, pretty much every major bodybuilder that has tried to maintain that 300 pound level over like 50 years old died. So, okay. yeah, a lot. Are you of talking what, with the guy from Canada? Uh, what was his name? Uh, Gigantic, four hundred pounds. Who was that? Yeah, Fred Kovacs, that guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Passed there's, away. There's, there's been several over the years. The guys that try to maintain that that really heavy muscle mass, you can't do it. You know, no. Rich Pian was another one. He wasn't even forty, I don't think. No. You know, you know, there's no you 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 know this. Uh oh, it never really works out. Oh, there you are. Um, you know, you you can't oh. you, you you can't yeah. necessarily make a connection uh between the two. Uh oh. I think you're cutting out. Oh, there you oh, are. There you go. Well, are you on your phone? That's much clearer than the uh, uh, the laptop. Hold on, I can't hear you. Oh, at all. You'll get it. Hey, David Ryman, what's up, my man? How's it going over in England? There we go. <laughs> I had you for a second. There you are. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hold on, technical issues here. Okay, this is good. It's great information, so people will wait. I got Kenny Wallach on here. I should get him on here. The top, Kenny's come a long way. He's like the go number one go-to guy in bodybuilding for posing and understanding the anatomy. Kenny, if you're still there, I'm going to shoot you a message to get you on here. If you would do us that honor, uh, that's good, Dave. Things are good in England. Getting into the gym yet? Not yet, right? But you can hear. Good. Okay. How about you, Gordon? Can't hear you. Mike, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. You good? You can hear me? I got a good number of people for this time of the day. Usually we go around uh, dinner time. But you can come back to this, folks. Uh, 
during the day and listen to it anytime. How about now, Gord? Uh-oh. Gordon's gone for a second, but I, I do want to touch upon, we've got another half hour. Uh, I want to touch upon a couple other things uh, as far as training goes and injury and getting around those things. And Gordon will prove uh, that you can uh, make results no matter who you are, as long as you are not a quadriplegic or you've had your head decapitated. There's, there's always, always, a, always a way. Hey, Gord, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Now I'm big we're no. back. More technical difficulties. There you are. You know what the funny thing is? That guy from the commercial, can you hear me now? He's from North Haven. You know that little dweeby guy from the commercial? My sister went to high school with him. Uh, I don't know, Gord. You're kind of freeze frame now. I'm noticing some gray hair. <laughs> Uh-oh. We'll get it. We'll get it. You know, it's struggle and difficulty. Through struggle and difficulty, goodness will come. It's 12 p.m. in China. Zinzu, tell us how it's going in China these days. Tell us the true deal about China. What's it like in China? Uh, I got Gordon coming back here. Here we are. Stream yard. There you are. Let's try gotcha. that again. Okay, yes. good. So we were talking, we were talking about these big, big guys and carrying you know, I had dinner with a, a former Mr. Olympia some years ago and I was sitting with him. Nice guy, smart, you know, it doesn't matter who. Uh, but his whole thing was this. He was at the point of this, and I bl believe me, listen, I can't do what they do. I never rip on anyone if I don't like, you know, I used this example the other day. If you're a hacky sack champion, I don't say hacky sack sucks. There's a chapter in my book, nothing sucks, because I don't do it. How can I diss someone for something they can do and I can't? But this guy was saying he could not wait to lose 75 pounds. He could, it's, I need oxygen to go up the stairs. My wife has to tie my shoes. I can't wipe my butt. And he said, who the hell wants to live this way? And, you know, Weeder wants me to try to sell this. And he had a real, you know, conflict and he's doing okay now. But, you know, do you get, do you, you know, your client base, you, you deal with some gigantic guys. Do they start to question why they're doing this? Well, I mean, so. I don't have like any real mass monsters that I work with right now. I've had a few over the years, but I, you know, the thing about me is I won't push the limits in terms of the supplementation side of things and stuff like that with people. So I don't end up with some of the 300 pounders and so, and so right. forth. I have guys over 250, 260. And yeah, you know, especially when they're shoveling food down in the off season and it's so hard to eat and they're stuffed all day, people definitely start to question what they're doing. And then it comes back to, you know, how bad do you want it and why are you doing it? You know, and, and then I guess that's when it's important to figure out if it makes sense for you to keep doing that. You know, you mentioned this to me in the past. When you're eating every 12 hours or every two hours, and there's guys that do it around the clock, they wake up. What does that do to the digestive system in the long run? Does it come right back necessarily? Or sometimes it's forever. Well, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not the eating two, every, every two hours that's an issue. And there's plenty of people that, that eat a system like that forever and they're completely fine. But the mass monsters have an issue because of the amount of food they're eating every two hours. So, oh. you know, for instance, when I was at my biggest, a normal meal for me would be eight to 10 ounces of meat and two to three cups of rice. And you're doing that times a day. Okay, so you come to a point where, you know, you're, at, you're trying to get your fourth meal down and you're still stuffed from your third meal. And it's basically like you're force feeding yourself all day to try to get that food in. And most people would say, oh, you get fat doing that. Well, no, if you have a fast enough metabolism and you're doing the right things, your body can sometimes process it. And so in order to keep growing, you have to keep shoveling that food in. And yeah, it becomes a huge, huge chore. Um, but that's something more at the real high end of things when the guys are really pushing the limits in terms of trying to get their weight up. Um, it's not normal for most guys to necessarily have to push their food up that high, thankfully. Your thoughts on this. I was talking to Gaspari a while back and he was relating to Zane, you know, Frank Zane. And, and he said, well, I know Frank Zane doesn't particularly like my style of physique back in the day. I was, you know, ripped and craggy and, you know, very, very muscular. Not very aesthetic, but, you know, again, I'm not dissing. And, you know, he's a friend and, and you know, I've, I've, I've admired him. But he said, even still, and even his company's marketing is geared towards the, you know, the Sadiq type of guy now. 
the physique. Uh, so like the trend is going away from gigantism to something that's more more of utility where the common man will say, hey, man, I want to get me some of that. Are you seeing more of that in your uh, clientele? Yeah, definitely. And I, and I think it's for a couple of reasons. You know, that men's physique or even classic physique look, for one, it's much more achievable for the average person. You know, being like 200 lean pounds versus 250 to 300. Um, it's also in terms of the the types of supplementation the guys have to use to get there it's way healthier to be on that little smaller side of men's physique but aside from those two things you know for guys that are getting into the bodybuilding world um and, and a lot of them want to get into modeling and stuff like that men's physique is a more marketable look you know in the bodybuilding world yeah we like to see that freaky look and we like to see no body fat and crazy striations everywhere but the general public doesn't like to see that. And you're not going to sell clothes and stuff with that kind of a look. Um, but when you have a nice, lean, you know, physique with a nice looking face, stuff like that, now that's going to sell. So a lot of these guys that are trying to cross over into fitness modeling and stuff like that, it just makes a lot more sense for them to be on that little smaller side of things. Not to mention they can do cardio more easily and stuff like that. <laughs> I know. I know this is a but different this is kind of a broad question, uh, but you know, let's say you've got women and men, average person trying to uh, 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 cultivate better health. Somebody who wants to become an athlete, feel better, compete. You've got all these different people. Where is that average person coming from when they come to you? In other words, how? Do, why do they come to you? Man, you know, it's a wide, wide range. I have people that come to me that have never touched a weight in their entire life, and they don't even know anything about lifting weights. There's a lot I of people, people like that. Gordon, there's a lot of people like that, isn't it? Isn't there? Everybody okay. thinks – Every I had a woman you – know, I do very limited people, on, you know, older people. And a, one lady didn't know – and I listen, I never, ever come across like, why the hell don't you know that? I don't, I don't know what I'm dealing with. She didn't know a bicep from a tricep. She just knew the arm. Yeah. So how are you going to go right into, oh, she's going to go on a Scott Curl apparatus? <laughs> it's not going to, there's a disconnect, right? Yeah. And that's more common than you'd think. There's a lot oh, of yeah. people like that that have, that have never touched a weight in their life or, or the only things they know are a squat and a bench press right. you know, or something like that. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of disparity out there, but that's why it's important for a coach, well, for one, to have kind of limitations with the people that he works with, you know, some coaches are better off working with those beginners that don't know anything, but other ones are probably better off. They don't want to deal with that real beginner level stuff necessarily. I kind of right in the middle. So I have a lot of both. So for me, it's a matter of taking, you know, the more advanced guys that know a little bit more, their programs are going to be set up completely different from somebody who's just getting started that is just walking in the gym. Because like you said, I'm not going to give a movement to someone just getting started that they've never heard of before, they're either not going to know how to do it or they're going to get hurt doing it. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, mention so something that's a little, that's a little funny. One thing about you, uh, because I make my living talking now, basically, you know, chiropractic means done by the hand and I'm, I'm not in that right now. So I'm not using my hands. So I'll approach you sometimes in the gym. I will say this right now. And this ties into my next question. Don't, don't, say anything to Gordon while he's working with someone. So if you do hire Gordon, let me tell you something. He is 100% focused on you. He doesn't have his phone. He's not staring at some girl's ass. He's not. He, it's all about you. And it comes down to this next comment, my friend from China, who's having a little personal issue right now, mindset. And he said, he's saying right now that we are both so positive. And he says as many Chinese youngsters are always very negative. So do you have people coming to you and they're just in this, this mire of discontent and, and negativity and you've got to try to pull them out? Yeah, you know, what I've found over the years is there, there's a great deal of people that for whatever reason are just miserable in their life. <laughs> and what is important for people to realize, though, is that that mindset is going to cross over to every single thing you do. So if you're going to be negative about what's going on in your day-to-day -day life, you're going to be negative about your training. You're going to be negative about your diet. Your, your results from all of it are going to show the negativity. 
And, you know, I'm a, I'm a true believer that it's important to be positive about everything you do. A positive mindset will help you in every single thing you do in your entire life. You know, no matter how tough things get, you need to stay optimistic. You need to stay positive. And, yeah, when people come to me in those type of mindsets, those are the people I get on the phone with a lot of times. And I say, listen, we need to have a discussion. And I try to get into their head a little bit. And there's definitely, you know, a psychological component to the work that I do with clients, too. Because a lot of times we're trying to figure out, well, you know, if you can figure out ways to make yourself happier and have less stress, your whole plan is going to work better and your whole life is, you know. So so in that regard, you know, part of what I do is even like a wellness coach. And I think yeah. that that's important for people is getting out of their own head sometimes, you know, because... I mean, when it really comes down to it, what is there to be negative about all day long? We don't have it that bad. You know, no, no. no matter what we have to complain about, when you really think about it, we have a roof over our heads. We have food. We can go to the gym and lift weights. Well, when this lockdown is over anyway, <laughs> we can eat. You know, we don't really have a lot to be negative about, especially here in the United States. So. I make it a point to really try to pull people's head out of their asses when it comes to that kind of stuff. You know, two, two things, Gordon. Um, I believe, I don't like the word believe because you believe in ghosts. I, I, I like to go with what I know, but I will say this. I believe some people actually have that negative encodement intertwined in their DNA. And it's just, listen, I, I went with a girl for a very short period. I could put her on a yacht with the Queen of England in the crystal blue Mediterranean eating creme brulee with an eight-piece woodwind band playing, crystal clear sky, everything is wonderful, and she would just be dour and, and it, it's not good enough. And, and, and listen, you must get people that come to you because, you know, listen, everybody's coming to you all day. And it, it's got it like when I was in practice, I loved it. You know, I helped a lot of people, but one of the things was you're seeing people at their worst. So in your case, it's almost like people taking a, an umbilical cord, attaching it to your thorax and trying to devour your soul because they're so beaten down. They've never had one person. And this is sad to me. They've never had one person say even a good thing. Happy birthday. You know, a smile. You know, their husband is nothing but relentlessly. I had a patient and she was crying. And I said, what's wrong? It's my birthday. And my husband gave me a gift and she opened it and there was a wrench and the, and the note said, fix the toilet, bitch. You, right. I mean, you must get some of that sometimes. Right. I mean, I know that's extreme, but, you know, people are beaten down. Yeah. But, but here's the thing about me. Now, when it comes to extreme ne negativity, I don't want that as a client and I don't want that as a friend and I don't want that in my life. No. So <laughs> you if you can't know that way. Yeah. Would you, would, you, way around me. Would, you, would you agree, though, because of your countenance and the way you conduct yourself and your business, you probably don't even attract that for the most part, right? You won't get it referred to you. I mean, your sphere of influence doesn't involve people like that, right? So you don't really get much of that, I would hope. Say, say that sentence again. You, um, you just cut out on me. Yeah, no, that's okay. okay. I would say you probably don't attract too many people like that because in your sphere of influence, it doesn't involve people like that, right? exactly yeah people like that aren't gonna get anywhere in the no. fitness world you know so so exactly yeah yeah so i, I, I deal think... with that a whole lot and the time that I, the time that i do deal with that mostly is when people are like to the end of a competition press miserable oh. because they're hungry and they're tired oh. and they're having a hard time that's when I'll time to get some of that negative mindset more than other times, which I understand because I've been there myself. It gets really, really tough at the end of a competition prep. But even then, I mean, it's important to turn that stuff around because, again, we have opportunity to be competing. We're choosing to compete and choosing to diet and go to the gym. And there's hey, Gordon, no Gordon. reason to be negative about that at all. Gordon, do you ever get like a husband or a wife or a mom or a dad calling you and saying, what the hell are you doing to my kid? And when are you going to be done with this? <laughs> oh, yeah. It happens all the time. That happens in relationships. It happens with kids huh. and their parents. It happens all the time when they say, how long are you going to be on this diet for? You know, or how long are you going to work out? For? 
is this is this something you know you're gonna be done in a couple of months or when your contest prep is over you're done with this so so you are and you're not you're not families out there, don't tend to understand you're not out there breaking up families i hope are you <laughs> no no i don't think so but i think that a lot of times there's a little bit of a disconnect in the house because you have a parent that has never experienced anything like this before and likes to eat whatever they want to and that kind of stuff. And then you have a kid that still lives with them, which may be not a kid, but maybe 20 years old, right. a bodybuilder six times a day. And his mom's trying to cook him food. And he's like, mom, I can't eat that food. I need to eat my chicken and rice. Yeah. And there definitely can be a little bit of tension because of that kind of stuff sometimes. Well, well growing uh, up, but I, no, I, I don't think. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, growing up, I used oh, to no, get, you know, know, I used to get like from, you know, an aunt or something. Hey, why don't you eat the spaghetti? You've got to get big. This is bodybuilding. So they don't understand, you know, the volume of food versus the quality. But, you know, Gordon, talking to John Romano, would you agree with this? John Romano said yeah. the thing that people have to do, and this is very important, is they have to suffer, suffer. Would you agree? To get in shape? Yes, to get in that bodybuilding competitive shit, you have to get to the point where you're suffering. Absolutely. We call it suffering, and it is suffering. You know, your food gets really low, and a lot of times you're doing an hour plus of cardio a day on top of maybe an hour of weight training per day. So, you know, we're sometimes toward the end of a competition prep trying to burn 500 or 1,000 calories a day more than we're, no more than we're eating. And when you're hardly eating anything, it becomes a miserable experience. You know, <laughs> think about up, think about getting up in the morning when you're completely starving. You haven't eaten in 12 hours, and you have to do an hour on the stairs before you can think about eating anything. You know, so it definitely can be hard sometimes, but it's different for everybody. And you know, there's a term that I think they said in the military too, but they say it in bodybuilding a lot. We say embrace the suck. Oh yeah, you know, and, I've heard that. And when you learn do that and when you learn how to associate that really shitty feeling with something positive then you can actually use that to your advantage so it just comes down to it's just another psychological trick to use for yourself i, I always used to so when i got super super hungry during competition prep to the point where i couldn't stand it and i was miserable well i knew that i was burning a shitload of calories i was ripping through body fat i'm like there's no food in my body my body must be burning through fat right now you know, and I always tried to keep a positive association like that in my head. Whereas if I'm full of food and I'm not hungry, I'm not burning through body fat right now. So I, I want to be hungry, you know, and it's little things like that that can kind of keep you going. I would attach, you know, uh, if I'm trying to get through a set and I've got to do these reps, I would attach, if I don't do this rep, my mother will die or my girl will leave me or my dog will, you know, disappear. Yeah. So you attach something that's, the dearest to you and if you don't do this you know like the superman model if uh millions will die if you are weak so you put some really weighted yep. circumstance on the other end it's a mental it's it's the mental strength really what it is right that's what it comes down to would you say ultimately it's mental it's it's completely mental and the strongest person mentally is the one that's going to do the best in competition because they're the ones that are going to be able to dig down, get all that body fat off, bust ass in the gym day and out, day in and day out, even without hardly any food in the plan. You know, those are the ones that are going to succeed. And it's the people that are not willing to push themselves through that desperate, uncomfortable level that are never going to be that successful. But I mean, if you think about it, your entire life is that way. If yeah. you're never, ever going to push yourself to that uncomfortable point, what are you ever going to accomplish? You know, and that's, and that's something that bodybuilding can really help teach people and can help them be successful in a lot of other areas in their life too. Once people compete in a bodybuilding show for the first time, or even just diet down to a low body fat for the first time, they become much more aware of what they're physically and mentally capable of. Oh, yeah. And that can lead changes later on hey, hey gordon i started competing when there was no music so you would just in 1979 was my first contest i was 15 and you were at the mercy of the throng and they were they didn't give a crap if you were 15 and i didn't have anything barely have it now but um 
the hardest thing I think to do, and I've done a lot of things in my life, is go on stage, no clothes on, under an unforgiving light, do this, and hope people clap. So if you can look good in that you know, position, you've really done it. Tell us about training your mother. Your mother is my age, 56, and she looks and she competes. How'd that happen? Yep. Yeah, so my mother didn't even touch a weight until she was in her 40s. And uh, she was originally a marathon runner, but her knees were getting really beat up and she couldn't run anymore. Uh, so she wanted something for her. Uh, because that kind of runs in my family. We work hard family. And so I introduced her to bodybuilding. And uh, I actually, for the first year or so, I actually trained with her every single morning in the gym uh, as a training partner. Um, and she began competing. She actually has done really well. She's won some competitions. Uh, she's even competed at Masters Nationals in figure, wow. uh, which was a pretty impressive competition for her. It was awesome. Um, and now I, now I don't train with her anymore as a training partner, but I coach her now. Right. Uh, so, you know, handle her full nutrition and her training. And uh, and I train her once a week, one on one down at the Montanary Brothers Powerhouse Gym. Um, but it's great. You know, my mom and I have always been really, really close. Um, so but what, can, I, can I say com for counter to that closeness? Are you able to maintain objectivity, meaning you'll you'll be as hard on her as you are on somebody you don't know as well? Because that's, you know, in, in the world of surgery, surgeons won't do surgery on their loved one because they can't pull that lever and make the decision these are the emotional component can you keep that out of it yeah it's funny actually we joke about it sometimes because i'm just as hard on her as i am and everyone else like i remember <laughs> one time i yelled at her for extra strawberry one time that she wasn't supposed to have and Whoa. oh yeah yeah it was really and uh you're just you're just you're, you're just getting back at her for den her denying you that dessert when you were a kid Hey, you know, speaking of family, your brother, I, I think if your brother pushed a few buttons, he might be able to give you a run for your money on stage, man. He looks good. We have good genes. <laughs> he looks yeah, a lot yeah, like, we have, he, we have he, look, he looks like this, almost the same body type. Is that true? Yeah, he's always been a little on the smaller side. He was always, you know, 20 or 30 pounds lighter than me. But when he lifts, yeah, when he's eating right and he trains, he, he blows up really fast. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, he kind of runs in my family. Um, my mother's the same way, obviously. So, you know, it's um, just good genes, I suppose. You know, my father kind of built just like I am as well. Uh, so, yeah, it's just something that's kind of genetically has just been passed down. We've always been athletic, um, been athletic family all around. And, uh, you know, those of us that have gotten into weight training have been pretty successful at it. You mentioned to me once that when you started, your Bible was the Arnold Encyclopedia. Is that true? Was what your 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 Bible from learning was the Arnold Encyclopedia? Is that true? That was one of them. Yes, that was one of the biggest ones that I started with. Yeah, absolutely. And I had the original one before they made the the before they re released it with the different cover and stuff. Um, but yeah, yep, yeah, that was one of my biggest ones ever. Um, why should I not take calf training advice from you? <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, anybody, 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 who's, anybody, who's, anybody who's listening, Gordon has tremendous calves. My calves have suffered the effects of malignant sarcopenia. My calves are, listen, if I didn't have veins, I would not have legs. Now, I don't know why. My calves used to be decent. I got a lot of years behind me now. I've been in this for a long, long time. And if you saw me when I was young, you know, maybe you'd be impressed, maybe not. But Gordon... So tell me about that. Why would I not take advice from you on your calves? Yeah, so I probably trained my calves directly like five or ten times in my entire life. But my calves actually came from uh, racing mountain bikes, which I did growing up. I was on a bicycle competitively for years and years. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what built them for me. But yeah, people, I laugh all the time because people ask me for my calf routine and I just tell them I walk around the gym all day. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's pretty frustrating for some people because calves are a funny body part. There's some guys, man, that genetically, they just aren't going to have big calves no matter what they do. And, uh, you know, that's another muscle that if you look at my whole family, we just all got huge calves. It's, it's, Every, it's, how about your mom? Does she have good calves too? She does. She does. So it comes from her yep. uh, combination. Um, 
we're almost yep. done. Uh, we got one hour, and I got to go pick my father up. Um, it's weird times. I go to my parents' house twice a day. My father can't see that well, so I've got to. I don't mind helping. He's eighty, but um, no gym. You know, I'm totally taking. Well, that's what I want to ask. You're still in great shape. What are you doing for yourself now? Because I know, um, you know, you maintain, you know, your 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 T-shirt says foundation. You maintain a good foundation, but have you changed what you do for yourself? You're staying lean, you know, uh, in this this time, which is going to pass. And listen, everybody listening, all will be well. Things will even be better because there'll be more appreciation. There isn't going to be any new normal. Forget about all that bullshit. Gordon and I are not going to get into politics. We could. <laughs> we could illuminate in a different way. But no, listen, you never change anybody's thinking. So, you know, we're not going to go there. But what do you what do you do now as far as food and training? What do you do? Yeah, so my um, my nutrition, for the most part, I eat whatever I want, but it's on the healthy side. And it's I don't call it this, but the way I eat is basically a variation of intermittent fasting. Um, so I basically, I eat until about 11 o'clock at night, but I don't start eating in the day until noon or so, or sometimes even after that. And personally, I like to be hungry and I find that my brain functions better when I'm hungry than it does if I'm full of food all day. So I start eating kind of late in the day. I'm usually about four meals a day right now. Um, and they're, and they're fairly clean. You know, sometimes I'll eat something from a restaurant or something, but for the most part, I'm eating chicken and beef and rice and stuff like that um in terms of training i'm i'm lifting i actually just started training with weights again i i have access to it right now thankfully so i've been doing a little bit um but i've been getting out and doing a lot more cardio work i've been getting out uh, a couple times a day for walks and hikes and stuff like that during this lockdown this is actually a time where i've had more free time than i've had since i was a kid so yeah. i've been trying to spend time outside you know enjoying nature and stuff like that just doing the stuff that I'm not going to be able to do as much again in a few weeks when we get back to life. I think that's, uh, so I that, think that's the, the main, I think that's important. And I think things are so out of our hands. And so at some aspects, I've always said, listen, if you have stress, sometimes that's, it's more stressful to try to eliminate the stress, just go with the stress and manage it because it's not going to go away. Allow it to be pressure. Pressure gets you to do things and achieve too much pressure is stress, never healthy. Um, let me ask you this. I'm going to give you five names and you're just going to give me, you know, a small, a short synopsis. And we didn't go over these names. Sometimes I go over the names, but, you know, we'll start with Arnold since, you know, you had his book when he started. Uh, yeah, Arnold, uh, you know, I think that he he's definitely going to always be known as one of the greatest of all time. But I think that, uh, you know, newer generation of bodybuilders have definitely taken things to another level. Do you think like these guys, a lot of these guys, they just and you're younger. I'm, I'm 16 years older than you. But you're you're on you're, you're you have a better your fingers on the pulse of many generations, I think, because you are you're a little I don't patronize ever. I only speak the truth. I don't kiss any ass. I think you know that um, it's when you're a free agent, you know, sometimes times are high, but when they're rough, there's no net at all. So I don't get that 1200, that 600. I don't get shit. Um, but like you said, I'm still eating, you know, it's America. You're, you're, you're nothing. The worst thing is not going to happen to you. Somebody will help you. Uh, uh, do you think, um, you know, like these young guys say, well, if Arnold had the gear today, he would be this and that. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's a matter because they're, they're all thinking. They're always thinking it's in terms of the – well, let me ask you. Here's a question I didn't, I want to get to, and I skipped it. You give me a hierarchy of importance right here, if you would. And it's kind of hard to, to delegate Wait, in your on. mind what this Bring is. You there now? Say that okay. Again. You, you, okay, you give me a hierarchy of importance here. Training, supplements, food, drugs. Training, supplements, food, drugs. Highest importance, lowest importance in being successful. Training, food, supplements, drugs. So I'd say in terms of building muscle. Yeah. Food and tra food and trading are tied at the top. Drugs are down below and supplements at the bottom. So would you agree? That's and again, when I say would you agree, I don't want you necessarily agree. But, you know, the drugs are more for repair and getting back to training quicker. It doesn't do anything magical. It doesn't what? 
it doesn't drugs don't do anything magical the main thing they do is they create anabolism meaning you you can you rest and repair quicker you can get back to training quicker that's the thing if the rest of your plan isn't right it doesn't matter what drugs you do and it doesn't matter how much you take and it doesn't matters so that training and nutrition are at the very top i tell clients this I'm never going to let you even consider any kind of performance enhancement until everything's moving along great with your diet and your training. Everything is moving along great in your regular plan because otherwise it, we're using the, you know, the drugs as a crutch for something that in the plan when re, when in reality, they should be more of a supplement, you know, to work because of a layer on top of everything else that's already right. Um, so no, the drugs aren't going to help anyone that is right thing to begin with. They're just going to allow somebody who is doing the right things to work even harder than they could before. Right. Okay. And, and in that regard, they're not even really giving anyone an advantage in terms of building muscle, because if you're not willing to put the work in, it's not going to matter. Yeah. You know, they're just allowing you to work harder than you could otherwise. You need that foundation. Four more, four more names and just give me your, your quick synopsis on each. Jamie Pinder. Jamie Pinder, my ex-wife, my best friend in the whole world. Uh, yeah, she's an amazing woman, and uh, I'm very grateful to have her in my life. Yeah, fifth at the Olympia in 2014, I think. And, uh, yeah, she's an amazing person. I, I want the secret to getting separation in the thighs like she had because I, I don't think anybody in human history had separation like that. I hope she hears this. Shelby Starnes. Shelby Starnes. Shelby was my first bodybuilding coach. Actually, my only bodybuilding coach, I should say. Um, he is a human being that I consider one of my biggest mentors in the fitness world. And the way I work with clients is fairly heavily influenced by the things I learned from him. Um, although I've added a lot more to it, of course, over the years. Um, but yeah, he's been another um, another very bright star in my life for sure so would you agree that everyone somebody will look at you and say gordon why do you have somebody helping you help all these people uh, you know uh, uh, i i think you know you look at michael jordan you look at tiger woods they have coaches i think you need that objectivity no matter who you are is that correct exactly the best in the world at anything has a coach chess champions have coaches yes. people have coaches for business Every athlete in the entire world that's at the top of their game has a coach, at least one coach, sometimes more than one, depending on what they're doing. Um, I don't think that there's ever a problem with having another set of eyes on you and a little more guidance, you know, especially when you're heading into an event where maybe it's messing with your head a little bit and you're not going to make all the smart decisions because of the stresses involved and stuff like that. Sometimes it's good to have a little bit of a network behind you. And I think that no matter how knowledgeable you are, it can never, ever hurt to have more knowledge on your side like that. Lance Armstrong. Lance Armstrong. This is an interesting one because I grew up as a cyclist. Um, so I actually really, really looked up to Lance Armstrong forever. And to be honest with you, um, you know, I still do. I don't like that he lied to everybody about the performance enhancing drugs. But regarding, he was one of the best athletes that has ever set foot on our planet. And um, I think he ruined his reputation, obviously. With, you, you, uh, with but you think, you, you, do you think he got somewhat of a raw deal? Because I think, you know, listen, I'm not, I, I, I celebrate humanity. I, I will say that much. But at the same time, listen, if you look at the NFL, they say they have a drug test. Well, listen, they, they tell these guys when the drug test is coming. Because I'm going to say this. People paying six hundred dollars for a ticket don't want to see guys that look like me playing. So you know, Lance exactly. got caught. Lance and was, he, was was Lance a target? Exactly. So professional cycling has arguably more drugs in it than professional bodybuilding does. Wow. Okay. And I've seen professional cyclists back in the day that would show up to a race with a tackle box full of different pills. Wow. Okay. So. Yeah, they made a big example out of him is what happened. And that was what was so sad about that was every single person in the entire Peloton was doing exactly what he was doing. And he was the one that got caught out with that. And yeah, so that, that was a pretty it was a pretty sad thing.
And that's you one think- of the reasons I don't, you know, ever bad about it. I mean, I the reason I still look up to Lance because he wasn't doing anything differently than anybody else was. No, no. You know? Do you do you think he sh- he would have been better off if he just came clean early on? I don't think anything would have worked out good for him. Yeah, if it was he bad. Came out clean, they would have. De- he lied. They demonized him. I he was screwed no matter what. At that point, he was they, a target. Yeah. So, if they want to get you, they're going to get you. And my last one on the list is John Meadows. Who, who's that? I couldn't hear it. John Meadows. Meadows. John Meadows, man, he is another awesome, awesome human being. Um, now, he was actually another one that's heavily influenced the way I work with clients, uh, but more in regards to his training. Uh, his training style is something that he has coined mountain dog training. Um, and it's a very, very intense system of bodybuilding. Um, and that's actually the way that Jamie and I trained uh, from 2010 to like 2016. Um, he was actually writing the programs that we were using. Um, he's one of the most knowledgeable people in the entire industry. Um, someone that I looked up to in a huge way, uh, both in both in terms of bodybuilding and in terms of what he's done in business. Yeah. Um, he makes a lot of money doing what he does. He's just super, super smart. And he actually left a career as a as a president of a bank. Yeah in order to do what he does now and work in the fitness world. And that really shows how passionate he is about what he's doing. Um, because that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty big risk to take. Well, I asked, I asked about him because um, we, I asked about him because of the obvious reasons, but also because he pursued a life of truth. I mean, I had very big clinics in, in practice. Uh, I got sick. It's the primary reason why I got, I can go back, but I do what I love now. And it's a risk, a lot less money at this point. Uh, but you know, he's overcome some severe, severe yeah. health maladies and he forges onward. He helps. So I mentioned him primarily because he's a good person. And I, all the people I interact with, I try not to deal with anybody who is a jerk, you know, because who, you know, listen, because there's other good people that we can get information. I won't go. Listen, there are certain very big name people I will not deal with because they may benefit me business wise, but I just don't want to be around that. And uh, you're you're a good guy. And I'm going to ask you now. I trained with you. I'm going to ask you, how did I do, man? Did I give a good accounting of myself? And I'm not going to say, oh, I was 54, blah, blah, blah. Did I did I could have I done more? Or how did I do? I trained with you for a while. Remember when Evan hurt his leg? What's that? What's that? No, how did I do training with you, man? Did I did I did I did I go hard enough or did I kind of leave some in, in the tank? No, you, you did great. And what you showed me was years and years of knowledge. You know, you're one that always had good form and that kind of stuff when we were working together, man. Um, no, no, nah, man, you did great. I like working with the older guys, man. It it makes me happy because the older guys tend to work harder than the younger guys do. Listen, you know, I'm going to tell you, I, you know, Bill, Bill, talking to Bill Grant and Bill 73 now, and you know, Bill, he's from the pumping iron years. He said that, and we're almost done. I have one more question for you because I know we both have to go. Um, we'll do this again, though, because you're part of my advisory board now. Uh, but Bill said, you know, listen, he, he used to do the bench press, the squat, the deadlift, and the military press. And now, to this day, He's still pretty basic in that sense, and he hasn't had a lot of injuries. So, you know, he doesn't get overly flower, flowery in what he does. And I think the older guys are kind of like that. But at the same time, I like to learn the new stuff because if you lend yourself the dogma and you never change, then listen, it's going to be harder to change with the times. I subscribe to the theory that if you see somebody – your oldest client I know is older than me. You've had a guy that's in the 60s and he was really in great shape. I think you've told me about. I'm not amazed by those oh, guys. Oh, yeah, I've had. I've had the I've had reason I'm not amazed, you know, some people, say, some people will say this guy is 72 and he can do 20 pull ups. My whole thing is I think people are, are should be able to do that. I don't think we should be amazed because if we're always amazed, then we don't allow it to be something that's universal. And everybody, they, they, they submit to the old aging thing and they, they're like bent over and busted up and they're pissed off. And so I'm not very forgiving. When I see somebody do that, I go, that's good, but that's how it should be, right? Yeah. Well, 
one of the beautiful things about weight training is it's one of the things in life where age is not a huge limiting factor. You can get an amazing shape even in your 60s, 70s, 80s. And, and that's one thing I like about this so much is the older guys are just as much of an advantage as the younger guys are really as long as their hormones are right and everything. And, uh, you know, a lot of times, in fact, the older guys with more time under their belt sometimes look way better than the young guys do. Oh, yeah. You know, just because of the sheer amount of time they've had under the, under the bar. You know, Gordon, so I have gonna... huge respect like you that have been in this game for 30 years. You know? Oh, thank you. Um, listen, it was, it was real, you know, listen, back in the 70s, if you, you didn't tell anybody you lifted until you started looking like it. <laughs> because and it took a long I you know I still don't look like I lift in clothes and not, that's not doesn't even matter but it was so disparaged that you know you were you know I, I don't care about your sexuality but you know you were gay you were weird you were stupid you were dumb you're wasting time um even the football I played at Notre Dame in West Haven it was a powerhouse and I I was going to a separate gym and, and the coaches not that they didn't care but they weren't like you gotta be here we had like a universal and it wasn't now they have complexes, you know, so we kind of knew and now everybody's agreeable to it. And the same people that made fun of us. I have a final question for you, Gordon, um, because I admire you as a guy who, um, you know, I don't just talk to anybody. Uh, I think most people are full of shit in general. I think most people live fraudulent lives. I don't know if it's intentional, but, you know, deep down, they know they're not doing the right things for themselves and they're waiting for some day and. We need to find people like you who, you know, can guide with light and illumination in the darkness. Um, so I've said this about you and, you know, I think it's it's relevant. You know, you look at guys like Shelby and you look at guys like, um, you know, any of the top, you, you know, uh, what's his name, Aceto. And I look at you as the same, you know, you could be the steward of information at that level. You know, in five, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? I hate this question, but where do you see yourself in five years? You know, you can get to that level. Do you even want to? Are you happy where you are now with what you're doing? You know, I'm different than those guys are because they only work remotely with clients like long distance and stuff like that. I really enjoy working hands on in the gym with people. So there's a little bit of a difference when you look at it like that. But no, I mean, I would love to, to build up and have a reputation like those guys do. Um, you know, those are some of the people I've looked up to for years and years and people I still get information from and people I still talk to here and there, you know, and, um, you know, those are the guys that all of us coaches look up to. And yeah, I would love to love to have that kind of reputation. But at the same time, I'm really happy with where I am right now in life, too. Um, you know, I have a lot of clients. Everyone's getting great results. So no matter where the next couple of years take me, I'm, I'm in a good place, man. And, uh, and I'm happy. I think that I think that's the right mindset, because if you go after that specifically, it's wrong. It's a cart before the horse. You just do your work. It's like I always say in business or anything that you're doing, you know, some people, you know, the way I come across positive or whatever, uh, you know, what's behind that? No, it's just it's just what you do. You truly have to help people. I had I used to have students in my clinic from Quinnipiac and uh, the one young girl, I asked her, I go, well, what's your goal? She's I just want to help people. I go, well, what about money? Oh, you're not about money, Dr. Deuce. I go, I'm all about money. I go, how could you say that? I got this beautiful office and all that. I go, how do you think I pay for this place? I said, you, you, have to, you have to help people. That's not extra. Like you hear about all these heroes right now. Listen, it's your fucking job. There's a swear. You're not doing anything extra. Uh, in my clinic, I'm helping people. You're helping people. That's not extra. You keep doing that. When the dust settles, you're just going to happen to have money. If you put the pursuit of money first, the shit shoveler from Sheboygan to the captain of the highest industry will see that you're full of shit and they'll pick up on it. They'll perceive yep. it. And ultimately, you might do okay. You'll never do as well as you could. So, yeah, the right mindset, you just, you just portrayed it. You're just doing this. And that'll come when it comes because it's right, right? Exactly. Exactly. If you get good at what you're doing, the money will come. Right. The money doesn't come first. The no, first no. thing is that you have to get good at what you're doing. Right. You know, and everything falls in line after. And I truly believe that, you know, and looking back, I'm in a way better place here at 40 than I was at 30 years old. You know, I'm 
acting like a fine wine, I think. So I have no reason to think that, uh, you know, the next three to five years are going to be uh, any worse for me. That's for I sure. have I have to really know this. Did it, did it bother you turning 40 this week? 40? <laughs> Not even a little bit. No. Because, you know, like I said, you know, physically and financially, I'm healthier than I was in my 30s. So I, I don't really have a lot to complain about. I don't have any gray hair. I'm, I'm healthy. I can pay my bills. What I'm good, you know? That's, that's all you need, man. Stay in the moment. You know, there's this old, um, I don't know, it's one of those Tibetan monk statements. Uh, if you live in the past, sadness. If you live in the future, and I did this for years. I used to tell my mother in practice, happiness she just wanted me to be happy and she would bring her hands michael you're you're you're, you're not happy i go happiness is weakness you will not succeed if you pursue happiness. i was like that for years and then of course i had you know i had an epiphany um but if you live in the future it's anxiety stay in the moment you have peace right peace you have peace right now so any listen absolutely anybody, Anybody listening here, Gordon did me a really big favor. I consider Gordon a friend, and I, I don't have a Facebook family. I don't have a lot of friends because I hold those words as sacred to me, family and friends. There's only a few family, friends. You know, you get older, listen, you're going to have maybe one or two because they start falling away. But Gordon, listen, if you want to contact them, only if you're deadly serious about making a change and getting ready to pump, pummel you pummel yourself and getting down to the bare bones and finding out what you're all about. That guy is the conduit, the bridge, the bridge too far, that 1975 movie that will deliver you and you can contact him. You know, you can, his name is highlighted. Just send him a message. Even if it's one or two people, doesn't matter. I endorse him. You know, he'll, he'll, if you have a clearly envisioned goal, you can get it through him because he has the information. He'll give it to you. So, Gordon, I thank you. Any parting thoughts? Uh, no, not really, man. I, I appreciate you having me on today, man. It was great to talk to you. And, uh, you know, let's do this again sometime. It was a lot of fun. I'd like to get you. I can get up to six people on here. I'm, I'm trying to think of somebody that we could have in tandem. You know, maybe even like your mom or something, but maybe somebody like Kenny Wallach or maybe somebody like Shelby Starnes. Uh, you know, and we'd have like a a, a, right. a theme behind it, you know, former student and, and how you help people because we got to deliver the message to people. People only care about what's good for them. And I, that that's, you know, I understand that. Uh, but I got to go because my father's waiting for me right now. And you know the old people, man. They're, you know, <laughs> he's going to hit me with his cane. You know, or he doesn't have a cane, but maybe he'll get one. I don't know. Hey, Gordon, thanks, my friend. I can't wait till we're back. Are we going to be back at Powerhouse? Are we going to be back at Powerhouse finally? Soon? They announced the, the gym's opening for the second phase of Connecticut, so June, I think. Oh, okay. I don't know when. Time God, before. man. You know, every, you know, uh, Cola Zina Bear, Hebrew, it sounds like Cola Zina Bear, Bear, Cola Zina Bear, all bad shall pass. All will be well. Always. Always. You know, because if, listen, if you don't think that way, what good is anything? Everybody, thanks for being here. Contact Gordon. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for all your comments. And we'll see you again tomorrow. We're going to do this every day. Thanks, Gordon. Thanks, Take everybody. Care, man. All right. Great to talk to you. All right, man. We're out. Boom.